The story of OSIRIS-REx is a fascinating one. It's a mission that sent a spacecraft on a seven-year journey that covered almost four billion miles to orbit an asteroid and even touch the surface to collect a sample of that asteroid. The sample then continued its incredible journey, coming back to Earth, re-entering our atmosphere on Sunday the 24th of September and touching down in the Utah desert. It contained a canister full of asteroid rocks that are over 4.5 billion years old and could contain the key to understanding the formation of our planet and even how materials essential to life ended up on Earth. Launched on the 8th of September 2016 from Cape Canaveral in Florida on an Atlas V rocket, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft embarked on a long journey to the specifically chosen asteroid called Bennu. This near-Earth asteroid was chosen for a few reasons. It's close enough to the Sun that the spacecraft could be entirely solar-powered, but not too far away into the solar system either, meaning the mission could be completed and return samples in a reasonable time frame. Out of the thousands of asteroids in this distance range, Bennu was chosen due to its reasonably large size, meaning it was more likely to find a suitable landing spot once we got there and due to predictions that it would contain a high level of carbon. As we'll see later in the video with the reveal of the first analysis and images of the return samples, this turned out to be correct. And even after just the initial analysis we've seen so far, Bennu is already a fascinating asteroid. After the 2016 launch, OSIRIS-REx reached the asteroid in December 2018. It began orbiting the asteroid and mapped the surface completely, providing several options for where we could land for sample acquisition. This phase also made Bennu the smallest body to ever be orbited by a spacecraft, and at the lowest stage the orbit was just 0.6 miles above the asteroid's surface. If you look at the full orbits of OSIRIS-REx, it's very impressive to see just how much happened. Eventually, the so-called Nightingale site was chosen, and after several manoeuvre rehearsals, it was time to go in for the TAG. The TAG-SAM arm, standing for Touch and Go Sample Acquisition Mechanism Arm, is outstretched, ready to briefly touch the asteroid surface. The goal of the mission was to collect samples from the very early solar system, and so at every stage steps were taken to reduce any risk of contamination of the samples. This included descending towards the asteroid at an incredibly slow rate, in order to reduce the risk of contamination of the surface of the asteroid with unreacted hydrazine propellant from the thrusters. On the 20th of October 2020, OSIRIS-REx successfully touched down within 92 centimeters of the target location. Once the TAGSAM head touched the asteroid, a burst of high-pressure nitrogen gas was expelled to blow small particles and rocks into the sample collector. This interaction was limited to 5 seconds to reduce the chance of a collision, and then the sample slowly backed away from the asteroid. Overall, everything went very well. That is, until we noticed some larger rocks had wedged under the flap meant to hold everything in, and some of the sample was escaping into space. While annoying, this didn't turn out to be the end of the world. The sample canister was simply stowed away a bit quicker than planned within the return capsule, preventing more material from escaping. This meant cancelling a couple of planned routines to check the weight of the sample collected. But since cameras could see plenty of material in the canister, this was deemed an acceptable loss. The return capsule included a series of anti-contamination measures to keep the sample pristine when it returned to Earth and also a massive heat shield to protect it on re-entry to the Earth's atmosphere. OSIRIS-REx didn't actually leave the vicinity of Bennu until May 2021, when it began its cruise back to Earth. On the 24th of September 2023, the spacecraft ejected the return capsule, which re-entered the Earth's atmosphere approximately 82 miles above San Francisco. It decelerated from 27 miles per hour to just 11 miles per hour, thanks to just the friction provided by the atmosphere. A so-called drogue parachute was meant to deploy at about 102 feet up, but I can't see it ever appearing in the footage, and there was never any confirmation that it did actually release. This parachute is just to stabilize the descent, and doesn't do too much to reduce speed, and it turned out not to be a problem. The second, larger chute did deploy, albeit earlier than expected, and a safe landing was achieved in the Utah Test and Training Range, completing a seven-year journey. Helicopters soon arrived at the capsule, which was well charred from the heat of re-entry, and delivered the recovery teams to safely secure the capsule. 
A mobile clean room kept the capsule free from contamination in the field before it was flown to NASA's Johnson Space Center the next day. This is where the samples will be stored and curated, with smaller samples sent out to other researchers, agencies, and museums regularly. If the return capsule had somehow opened early, it had a few ways of protecting the sample from Earth's air for a while. The sample was stored at the end of a labyrinth of tunnels that would apparently take air approximately 40 hours to get through, and the sample was also under a nitrogen purge, which is a nice non-reactive gas that doesn't affect the sample like air would. Once it reached Johnson, the return capsule has slowly been opened, and it revealed a big surprise. There was way more material than expected, and there was also quite a lot on top of the canister itself, with some sitting here on the avionics deck as well. This is extra compared to what we planned for, and an initial analysis of these freebies has already taken place. On the left here, we can see the Taxam canister still stored away. That's the vault containing the main sample. And on the right, we can see all this extra material that was brought back too, pushed to the edge of the return capsule by the nitrogen blast that helped collect the sample. As I'm recording this, the main canister hasn't been opened yet. The process has been slowed down by finding all this extra material that had to be pristinely dealt with. But we already know a lot about the asteroid it came from thanks to this early analysis. What we found was surprisingly high levels of both carbon and water in the grains. This is incredibly exciting, since both of these things are essential building blocks for our planet and for ourselves. The first sample analysed was 4.7% carbon, making this the largest carbon-rich sample ever returned to Earth. The mission's goal was to collect about 60 grams of asteroid dust and rocks, but currently our best guess is that we actually managed to bring back about 250 grams plus all the extra on the avionics deck. The sample only landed on September 24th, and by the 27th, scientists had the first samples under an electron microscope to study them. And this is what they saw. These are four examples of the sample under the electron microscope. In the top left, we see water-bearing clay minerals. They have a fibrous structure that we call serpentine, and this clay material has water locked inside its crystal structure. This is an absolutely stunning thing to see on an asteroid that's older than the solar system, or at least as old as it. It's how we think water ended up on our planet, locked inside crystal structures like this, that made their way to our fledgling Earth 4.5 billion years ago, and eventually the water escaped into the atmosphere and oceans. Without crystals like this from asteroids like Bennu, we don't think we would be here today on a habitable planet. In the upper right, we can see a sulphide mineral with a hexagonal shape in its crystal structure. Minerals like this help build amino acids that give structure to our proteins, and are responsible for lots of biology, also making them essential for life. The two other panels are iron oxides, or magnetites, each with a slightly different shape. These can help with chemical reactions and catalyze certain processes, so we're looking at minerals here that are all essential for building a habitable planet. This next graphic is X-ray computed tomography, similar to a CAT scan. This lets us look inside the rocks without cutting them, and this one here shows the biggest one in the initial sample, at about 2 millimeters across. It lets us analyze the sample in a non-destructive way and decide intelligently where to cut into the rocks in the future. In red, we can see those sulfide minerals we mentioned earlier, and these might be sites that we look to study further in this sample. Here, we have a close-up of the sample sat on top of the Tagsam canister to see some nice examples of the different types of rocks we brought back. In particular, square B shows some of the troublemaker larger rocks, the exact type and size that trapped that flap open and allowed some of the sample to escape. Large rocks are great as they contain lots of material for science, but these are some of the ones that threatened the sample in space. C shows some of the finest grains we've seen so far, and D and E show a distribution of different sizes, just like the ones we saw on the surface of the asteroid. It showed a sort of salt and pepper appearance, with some lighter and some darker grains, and we can now see those different reflectivities here too. Here is one more close-up. On the left it's shown in standard visible light, and on the right we're seeing it under ultraviolet light, highlighting some specific molecules. The light bluish fluorescence to the center right is from carbon-rich materials. The light spots all over the sample are globules of organic material found all throughout the sample, and it looks like stars in space. I just love this symmetry. 
Organic here doesn't mean living material, but again refers to carbon-rich material. Nothing living could have survived the intense radiation that this material has been subjected to in space, so we're not worried about alien life being present here. These are the first results from the sample, but what's next for it? The first task is to continue disassembling the TAGSAM canister to retrieve the full sample. It will be weighed and kept safe at Johnson Space Center. Over 70% of the sample will be left untouched and stored away for future scientists to study. This means that scientists that aren't even born yet will be able to study these asteroid samples with technology and resources that aren't invented yet to answer questions that we probably haven't even thought to ask. This is standard practice for sample return missions, meaning we don't have to go and get more asteroid rocks too soon. And for example, it's also been done with moon rocks from the Apollo missions. The Bennu samples will all be slowly removed in small trays from the canister, and in about six months, a sample catalogue will be released. This will show scientists around the world what kind of samples are available to study, and those scientists will then be able to submit proposals for work that uses a small sample. These proposals will be reviewed, and within nine months of the sample landing, researchers will be sent some of the rocks to work with, and the science will really kick up a notch. Even before that though, three samples will be sent to museums in the US for display, so it'll be possible for us to see these samples very soon. The OSIRIS-REx spacecraft itself isn't done yet either. After it dropped off the return capsule to Earth, it changed its trajectory, and is now heading towards another asteroid. It's now been renamed Osiris Apex, and will reach a near-Earth asteroid named Apophis in April 2029. It will orbit and study this asteroid for 18 months, and while it won't return a sample to Earth, it will perform a similar tag manoeuvre in order to expose the subsurface of the asteroid, allowing us to study Apophis in more detail. So what is all of this for? Why do we really care about these asteroids anyway? It's to understand the materials that formed our planet and our solar system. This asteroid is made of rocks that have been floating around in space for four and a half billion years, unchanged by an atmosphere or by life like all the rocks on Earth have. In order to study material that formed our planet, we need very old, unchanged rocks, and that's exactly what these are. We're already seeing that they contain molecules that are essential for life, namely water and carbon. The mission also gives us more information about defending ourselves from potentially hazardous asteroids. When TAGSAM bounced off the surface, it felt almost no resistance, telling us about the composition of rubble pile asteroids and how we might deflect them. This is again just like DART did, and seeing how loosely combined they are also suggests that missions like this would be very effective at redirecting asteroids if we ever needed to. Leave me any questions or comments down below, and I'll answer as many as I can down there. And thanks a lot for watching. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye!